Hey everybody, welcome to Open Door Philosophy, a podcast where an undergraduate philosophy major and his former high school philosophy teacher discuss a variety of philosophical topics in an understandable way, all towards the purpose of living a good life. Wondering if I'm a thought experiment, I'm Andrew Graziano. And thinking about what the beetle in Andrew's box looks like, I'm Derek Parsons. Welcome to episode 33 with special guest Dr. Helen DeCruz. She's here to discuss her latest book, Philosophy Illustrated, 42 Thought Experiments Brought in Your Mind, and has everything to do with thought experiments and how those factor into philosophy. And as a bonus feature, she's also the illustrator of the book. It's a wonderful conversation, and I hope you're looking forward to that. But before we do that, uh, Mr. Parsons, how, how are you doing? Andrew, I'm going to project myself into the future. Yeah, I'm so lost where we are uh, in the future. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we've been recording a bunch of these. Okay, in the future when this episode comes out, I will be getting ready to go to Colorado. And I, w- I am excited about that. And I'm packing lots of books. And you're like, why are you packing books for Colorado, Mr. Parsons? Because we're going to sit around and read a lot of them. In between <laughs> wonderful things like hikes and delicious food and rafting and drinks and ah. Jeez, I'm having such a great time in Colorado. <laughs> That's funny. Current me, we just had high school graduation last night, uh, which is always a bittersweet event for me. Uh, so oh. happy for the students. But I know some of those hugs, are the last ones we have for quite a while. So anyway, that's me. Dang. How about you, Andrew? Uh, future Andrew will be in Italy. Uh, how's yeah. Italy going for you? Uh, I think... I th- I'm hoping it will be good on our uh, on our episode that will about to come out in two weeks from this one. I say uh, I hope I didn't get robbed or something like that. Uh, so I'm still <laughs> hoping right. I didn't get robbed. I think hopefully everything will be good. Hopefully I'll be enjoying everything. I think. Wait, so wait. I- a vision. A vision is coming to me. <laughs> I see you in Italy <laughs> on this day. You are sitting in the beautiful Florence sun, enjoying a margarita pizza (laughs) in some fancy villa with a glass of wine. (laughs) Ah, you've just seen Michelangelo's David. I mean, can it get any better? What a day. I'm so happy for you. Oh, that's a pretty cool crystal ball. Uh, (laughs) 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 Yeah, that sounds, that sounds nice. But future or current Andrew it's Sunday, so it's very hot in Houston. I don't think it's going to be any better in, in Florida, unfortunately. And I did not just have high school graduation, but uh, empathizing for Mr. Parsons, because I know that he was uh, really close with this current class. So or that's at least what I've heard. So I know that's a very bittersweet moment for you. But uh, I'm just such a sap. That's the problem. <laughs> Well, it is hot. It'll be hot in Florence too, but uh, the humidity is less. So, you know, much That's nicer good. climate. Looking forward to but that. Yeah. yeah, I bet. I bet. Let me well, say, guys, let me today... say, oh, go let ahead. Let me say before we do this, uh, let me say hi to my mom. I know she's, she'll, she'll be listening and I know she'll probably be uh, missing me. Uh, so, special shout out to her. Uh, shout out to mom. We love it. Moms are the best. <laughs> Okay, well, everyone, we're so excited today to have Helen DeCruz on the show talking about her book that deals with thought experiments. Thought experiments are something that is very much so a part of philosophy. We've talked about so many of them over the episodes that we have. And so today will be a focus on what thought experiments are and how they can be incorporated into our daily lives and uh, some other challenges that were involved with creating the book. So we're really, really excited about it. I hope you guys uh, enjoy Today, we're excited to welcome to the show Dr. Helen DeCruz, whose most recent book is Philosophy Illustrated, 42 Thought Experiments to Broaden Your Mind through the Oxford University Press. Helen DeCruz holds the Danforth Chair in the Humanities at St. Louis University. Her work examines the question of how and why humans are so interested in pursuits that seem far removed from immediate concerns, such as philosophy, mathematics, and religion. She is the author of several monographs, including Religious Disagreement from Cambridge, Wonderstruck, How Awe and Wonder Shape the Way We Think, which is forthcoming, and I'm looking forward to that, and uh, also co-authored A Natural History of Natural Theology through MIT Press, 
In addition to papers and peer-reviewed philosophy journals such as Philosophical Studies, Australasian Journal of Philosophy, and Philosophers Imprint, she is also a published short fiction author in venues such as Escape Pod and Hyphen Punk and plays the Renaissance Lute and Arc Luke. Helen, it's so wonderful to have you with us today. Welcome to the show. Nice to meet you both. Helen, before we get to the book, which of course I'm very excited to do, you got to tell us a little bit about the Renaissance lute. Oh, yeah. It's such an interesting instrument. Uh, so there is a lot of music written for it. And it was basically in vogue from the late 15th century until about 1600. Uh, this, so the, as I said, there's a huge repertoire for it. I was very fortunate uh, to learn to play it when I was a student in high school and university in Belgium. And... Uh, I had a very good teacher, so I, I play sort of decently, uh, but it's, it's interesting that uh, to, to continue to explore and play that. It's a beautiful instrument. I at school, we, I used to study music before I studied philosophy, and I had to do a early Renaissance like music class, so we studied a lot of like lute players and lute music, but I don't remember too much of it, but uh, it's a really beautiful instrument. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it's very complicated music. Oh, I'm sure. Well, we're very interested in origin stories. So again, before the book, one question we always like to ask. So how did you come to philosophy? Mm. How did you, how did it end up being something that you have invested majority of your life in? So philosophy didn't really come into my radar until quite late. So I hear of other people that their parents were philosophers. That must be difficult. I really sad about my <laughs> kids, like, you know, it's tough. Uh, or, or that they came to it like very young. But in my case, that, that just wasn't, uh, that wasn't the case. I was, uh, I grew up in a working class family. So my father was a bricklayer and my mother was a homemaker. And, you know, sort of any sort of academics was already sort of seen as, as strange. Uh, and I did try to, you know, improve myself. And the very first philosophy book I read was Hume's Treatise on Human Nature, which I got from the library, uh, translated mm. into Dutch um, when I was 16. And I didn't understand the word. I thought, what is this? Like, it was so perplexing. Like, I didn't understand anything. Like, I thought it was just white language, but, but nothing is happening. So I thought philosophy is this really obscure, weird thing. So when it then came to going to college, uh, and I attended just a local college, and this is something that happens a lot in Belgium. So college is very differently organized. Uh, so I went to the college, which was very close to the village where I uh, lived. And I thought about philosophy, but then all the, the high schoolers that I knew who wanted to study philosophy were such condescending pricks. And I thought, it mustn't be fun <laughs> being around these people. So again, I decided to study art history. Uh, because I'm very interested in art, in all sorts of different arts. And this one was uh, like you could study, uh, there was theater, there was music, there was visual art, which I was particularly interested in. But I took a lot of classes because as a major, I took non-Western art. Uh, and yeah. that uh, allowed a lot of classes. So I took philosophy classes, but they were all philosophy outside of the Western tradition. So it was Indian philosophy, Chinese philosophy, and uh, philosophy of the medieval Islamic world. Uh, and that I thought was really interesting. So that's how I gradually came to philosophy. And then it would take me a long time to actually look again at philosophy outside of the West. But originally, that was actually my entry into philosophy. And it, it, it got to me like, originally, my motivation for studying art was that I think that art really deeply engages with the human experience. And I still mm. think that that's true, right? Uh, art, you know, it's sort of like we express all sorts of things very difficult to express in other ways. But I think that in a sense, philosophy does the same thing. So that's how I ended up there. Oh, that's really interesting. David Hume as, as an entry to philosophy. <laughs> yeah. You know, you, usually it's something like Plato's <laughs> Republic or, or something like that. Descartes' meditations, or yeah, David <laughs> it would have been better. Right. Yeah. <laughs> right. So, your book, Philosophy Illustrated: Forty-two Thought Experiments to Broaden Your Mind, 
is a wonderful book. And the thing that's uh, intriguing about it is, well, so for our, our audience, we do try to make uh, philosophy accessible. We try to approach philosophy in a way that is it makes it applicable for people who might not be terribly familiar with philosophy. So thought experiments are really a fundamental aspect of philosophy. Well, I don't know if it's fundamental, but it's certainly present in a lot of philosophy. And so this book, 42 Thought Experiments, covers a wide range of, of different areas of philosophy and the thought experiments that are within them. But the intriguing thing about the book, of course, aside from the written text, is that with each thought experiment, there's an illustration by you. So you are the illustrator as well as the editor of this book. So we have lots of questions about the book itself and then how that relates to philosophy. Yeah. So I guess a great first question to ask is, how did the idea for this book come about? I started to draw thought experiments just for fun. Like I like to draw stuff. Uh, I've, uh, I've always drawn stuff. I remember like one of my earliest memories is when I was three years old and I was trying to draw a donkey. And I got so angry. Like I remember the sense of rage because the donkey would not look like a donkey. I knew what they looked like. There were donkeys close to where we lived. Like we lived sort of quite rurally. There was a farm across, so I knew what they looked like. And this one looked like a horse. And I got so angry. I took my glasses, like I had glasses as a, as a three-year-old, and I threw them across the room and they broke because these were glass glasses. And my parents were so angry. But anyway, so I remember, uh, you know, so I've always enjoyed drawing. And, and doodling. So I drew these thought experiments and I uh, drew them on my iPad. So they are uh, drawings that are done in a digital medium. And at the time I was posting quite a bit on Facebook. I've since moved to Twitter because I enjoy the interactions more there. And uh, I posted these and I said, look, here is uh, the cobbler and the prince. And here is, I think one of the very earliest was Parfit's Russian mm. nobleman which is this thought experiment about a Russian nobleman who in his youth is very idealistic and wants to give his estates to, to the peasants when he passes away. But he also worries that when he grows uh, older, he will become conservative uh, because that happens. It seems to happen to people. So he sort of puts in his, uh, he writes a deed saying, you know, when I change my mind later, then, you know, there's still for the, for the peasants. And he says to his wife, like, don't change it. Like, whatever I say later, don't do it. Uh, but then, indeed, sure enough, he becomes conservative, and the wife uh, is now asked the question, should she, should she change it? So I drew this picture of this ponderous uh, Russian nobleman, and, and that's when people started saying for the first time, like, this could be a book. So I, I drew more and more of them. It was just also a fun project in itself, and it, I had lots of input from people like, how do you imagine the grass counter looks like in rolls? And, you know, what, what, what comes to your mind when you think about Zhuangzi and the butterfly? Uh, and then I would draw them. Uh, and, you know, uh, that, that basically, it was a sort of collective project. And uh, people started volunteering, like, you know, I'd be happy to write something about this. I'd be happy to write something about this. So that sort of gave the idea of the, the pictures. And then people actually approached me. So there was a trade publisher who approached me, but that didn't work out because the vision that I had for the book didn't work with the sort of coffee table light on the philosophy thing that they envisaged. Mm -hmm. Then there was a, a, an academic publisher that mostly does teaching that wanted to just have like a sort of narrative written by somebody else and then some pictures of mine in between. Uh, but I thought, no, I want just, you know, I, I sort of started getting this vision of thought experiments visual commentaries in the form of these pictures, and then experts talking about them, including, if possible, uh, the people who invented the mm, thought yeah. experiments, if alive and available. Um, so that's how the project took shape. And then David Chalmers uh, said, you should try OUP. And I thought, no, OUP are so serious. <laughs> like, they don't do things like that. <laughs> but... You know, I thought there's nothing lost in trying. So I send it on. And OUP is very slow in its review process. Mm. So it took like six months and there were five referees. And it was, it was a very long process. 
but eventually um well it did it, it happened it happened so as you can see so that's sort of the genesis of the project that's oh, fascinating yeah you know we, so the format is you, you present a thought experiment well you have the illustration then you present the thought experiment then a philosopher provides some commentary analysis and then at the end some, there's some very helpful questions to think about which is great i love the questions so i did notice that there was uh, n- not a single duplicate as far as a, a philosopher who provides commentary and analysis. So this must have been a really exciting collaborative project with all those different people. It's fun, though. It's also a total nightmare. Oh, to I'm sure. <laughs> uh, 42 sets. Like, this is even more than 42 people. Like, you know, when do you stop? Like, there were a few people who fell out. Like, they said enthusiastically, sure. yes. And then it just completely went silent. Like, when do you move on? When do you, like, things like that. So that was difficult. It's very difficult when it's such an enormous number of people. But on the other hand, it was still okay because I think that, and I've edited a fair number of works, that if, um, you know, if it's an 8,000 words, wrought scientific paper, that people are more likely to fall out because life gets in the way. Mm-hmm. Whereas these are very short reflections, like they're about 1,500 words each. So it's, it's sort of doable. And it's usually also really within the, the expertise mm-hmm. of the mm-hmm. philosopher who writes the reflection. Yeah, you know, the short nature of them is, is nice too, in that with the way the book is put together, you probably want to think about these thought experiments a little bit. And so you can, in a single sitting, read two or three of these, and it could take you probably quite some time to, for your own self, like mentally move through these thought experiments and think about what the philosopher has said. So it's a, it's a great format that's very digestible that someone can just sit down and and read a few. You don't have to sit down for three hours and, you know, for a long sit and really, really thought provoking things. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. I I just sort of wanted to say something about that. Like, it felt to me like philosophy comes in so many different formats. But one of the things that we try to instill in our students when we teach philosophy is like philosophy is really long and hard. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and I think philosophy is hard even when short. But, you know, there are sort of like these short moments of, of philosophy that we have, like the, you know, the short form. Uh, and I thought with this book, it'd be nice. It's like, I liken it sometimes to myself to it like a box of chocolates. So I really deliberately want this to be, even though some of the thought experiments are a bit disquieting, that still it's overall a kind of a fun mm-hmm. experience, right? That you can sort of delve in and think, I want to think more about this thought experiment. I was just going to ask you before you brought that up, is there some specific way that you kind of envision people reading this? Do you want people to, uh, you know, sit down at night and, and read one of these as a time kind of as a reflection on something? Or is it appropriate for to read multiple and kind of ref- reflect on them? I think people can read it however they like. So OUP had a very specific vision of using this in teaching, which I think should work well. And I'm, I'm very curious to hear of people who will mm. use it in teaching, like what the experience is. But I think, yeah, you could read it like as an even in evening reflection, right? You know, we have lots of uh, contemplative traditions where we do that sort of in a religious mode, but this could be a secular way to sort of think about important things or, or just things that we hadn't considered in our everyday lives. But you could also binge them, right? So I think you could read them however you like. Yeah, speaking of, of multiple traditions, one of the things I really appreciate about the book, uh, sometimes philosophy can be, at least over here in the States and in Europe, can be notoriously Western. Uh, I appreciate that you've included a lot of thought experiments that are outside of the Western tradition. That was a deliberate choice to sort of show philosophy as something that is done by all people. Uh, and then I was also still limited by you know, the knowledge that I had. So that, that's sort of the limitation. So there were two limitations. One limitation is the, the knowledge of philosophical traditions that I have, which is broad, but, but still. Uh, and the other thing is like, can you imagine it? Can you actually picture something where the picture is not just like a doodle, but really something that adds a visual commentary? 
And I'm also hoping that the diversity of people portrayed in the thought experiments can give us a bit of a broader range of, of who is all involved in philosophy, because you still have sort of like the kind of thought experiment where you have Jones and Smith. And Jones and Smith are just like, you know, Jones and Smith could be anybody, right? They could be very diverse individuals. But I feel like our mental imagery tends to veer to all sorts of defaults. That's in fact what's happening with mental imagery. So we know with mental imagery, if you say Smith and Jones, this or that, you'll see two white men, mm. right? So, so it's interesting to think about like what, what sort of traditions do we look at and also like how are we going to depict the philosophical thought experiments, including those from the Western tradition. This is not a, a question that I'd planned, but I'm, I'm really curious about this now. Do you have an illustration or, or a, a chapter that you're most proud of in the book? Is that, is that something that you have particularly? Hmm. It's hard to say. If I had to pick one, then I think I'm going to go with Judith Jarvis Thompson's mm. People Seeds. So People Seeds is this thought experiment where imagine that you uh, want to air your room, but there's seeds drifting in the air, like pollen. And when they take root in your carpet, they grow into people. Now, you don't particularly want people in your house other than yourself. So what you do is you put a fine mesh on the windows. However, occasionally, a seed does slip by and take root should you uh, harbor this person. So this is very clearly like this is, she, she doesn't, uh, it's about abortion, mm -hmm. right? I mean, you see this very clearly. Uh, and it's interesting because it, it appears in a pair of thought experiments. So in, in a paper on abortion, I think 1971, and she wrote the, the thought experiment together with another thought experiment of uh, the violinist. Uh, so you have this violinist and you have to be attached to this violinist for nine months. But at any rate, thinking about the people seeds, I was thinking about actually this is like a weird fiction and it's also horror. Like it's it's a mm. horrible idea that sort of people grow on your carpets. Yes, it struck me as that too. Yeah, it's just horrific, right? And 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 half of the world population, roughly, at some point, has to wonder maybe this will happen to me. And you know, even if if you do want children, maybe you don't want them at that exact moment, or it's not opportune, or whatever. So I drew, um, I took the scenery of the Colosseum of Goodnight Moon. I put in a creepy doll. Uh, I then also thought about, you know, the sort of religious imagery of, uh, of the Virgin Mary who gets, uh, you know, the annunciation of the angel Gabriel who says uh, that, that she, you know, will be pregnant and she wonders, how is this possible? And this must be a feeling many pregnant people have had, like, how is this possible? Like, how could this have happened? So I wanted to put that in. So you have this annunciation imagery from like 15th century Italian painting. You have the good night moon scheme, and then you have the bedroom at Arles, which is, you know, like the bedroom by it. So, so it's based on that look. So all these things came together. Like, I don't know if that's visible, but the intention was there to sort of use these layers of cultural references that at least some of us will pick up on to, to think more about abortion and, and all the diarized dimensions of what it, what it involves. Yeah, when I was reading the book, I immediately thought of uh, when it came to the violinist people seeds thought experiment. Of course, I, I couldn't help but reflect on the current climate uh, in the United States uh, surrounding Roe versus Wade and and abortion rights. In what way can thought experiments like violinist people seeds? Uh, how can it not just be something interesting to think about, but something that can actually help us navigate our contemporary problems? I think that thought experiments have a tremendous power because they, uh, by basically being free of uh, the sort of the here and now, and giving us the ability to do really weird stuff like people seeds, after all, you know, there are no people seeds, but you can imagine people seeds um, that they give us a way to sort of be free and to think freely in a way that is very hard to do. Like, I don't know, I have the past days sort of zoned out a bit from Twitter because it's like, like everything feels like it's nothing going to change, right? People who think there must be more strict gun reform, 
uh, that there must be better gun laws. I feel like it's never going to happen. But with philosophy, you can think like, what if, right? What if it happens anyway? And that what if can be very freeing. And in fact, there are ways in which thought experiments have had a profound impact on the world. And one thing that I want to just talk about is the thought experiment by Rousseau about the stag in the hair that, you, uh, that is also illustrated in the book. And it's actually part of a larger thought, set of thought experiments about what happens when people are just left to their own devices and they don't have government. So you have, for example, Thomas Hobbes' idea of the state of nature, where actually we're in a sense of fear, like we're, we're afraid. And unfortunately, in American society, this hits very close to home. So that when Hobbes describes this, the idea that you could just be murdered like that, uh, you know, by some, some random person gives you a sense of fear, dread, and disquiet. And Hobbes says, this is very bad. And he oriented his entire philosophy, or a significant part of it, to try to get us out of that state of nature. And you see that, so, so that's philosophy. When, when Hobbes thought about the state of nature and imagined this, it was a way to really try to deal with some practical problems that he saw in his days and that we still see today. That's really interesting. Um, I think, I don't think I've ever really thought about thought experiments as, well, I mean, I have, but never, never in that way, kind of a, a what if kind of playground for the mind. I normally think about thought experiments, probably not a very fair assessment for myself, but I think sometimes thought experiments can be almost too, too unrealistic to be in some sense, practical. Do you think that's some kind of uh, possible criticism of thought experiments? Well, I think that thought experiments can sometimes be too unrealistic. So, so sometimes the thought experiment sort of breaks down mm -hmm. because something important was not considered. Like, for example, take Mary's room. Like, if you think about it, the chance that she would genuinely have never seen red, you know, like, it, it's very hard to imagine. Right. Um, so I think that sort of takes a little bit away from the power of the thought experiment, though I still think it's very beautiful. So I find Mary's Room, the story of this woman who grows up as a brilliant neuroscientist in a, in a room just with black and white media and about what happens when she gets out of that room. There's a moment of poetry and beauty there. So I thought, what would she see outside of the cell door? Like, uh, and I thought she might see red flowers, right? So that's sort of like poppies, maybe. So, so there is a sign of quite a beauty in it. But at the same time, it's an unrealistic thought experiment. So you need to really suspend your judgment. I think that the proof is really in the eating with thought experiments. Like they can be completely wild and bizarre, but they could still have such an enduring influence. I think one of my favorite thought experiments to draw in the book also and also because it was so hard, was Plato's cave. That's such a beautiful analogy and completely unrealistic, right? You have people who are chained to a wall. You have uh, imagery on the cave. And, and then they get released. They get outside. And it's, it's also sort of really beautifully described about how first the sun is too bright and they have to look at reflections in the water. And, and, Gradually, their sight adjusts. But then what, what if you go back into the cave? Then, you know, your sight will have been adjusted to the light. And that's why educated people strike the ignorant as so strange, right? That's why the ignorant might even want to kill the educated person or the enlightened person. Um, and it's, I think it has such great power. It's completely unrealistic as a story, but it's a beautiful story. And I was thinking about like, you know, what does this story do? So for the longest time, I was just looking, and this was a big problem for some thought experiments to draw because I'd seen so many drawings already. And this was the case with Plato's cave. So if you Google Plato's cave, you will see pictures of a cave and people sitting at the wall and, you know, a diagram. And I didn't want to draw a diagram. So I thought eventually the book is going to go in without this thought experiment. And I felt really bad about it because I love the thought experiment. There's a couple of other ones that I didn't manage to get in because I just couldn't make a good drawing. But then I was uh, reading sort of YA fiction to my son, uh, who's nine. And uh, there is, for instance, The City of Ember, 
which is the story about young people who are in the city. And actually, they were there under the ground to wait for nuclear war to end. In the meantime, the lights are slowly going out, but they're still stuck under the ground. And you have these young people who, of course, showed away to the outside. And I thought, this is Plato's Cave. Like, the whole story is basically Plato's Cave. Plato's Cave is a YA novel. It's a YA novel of young people who, you know, like a bit like Divergent and The Hunger Games who think outside of the box. And so once I got that idea, I thought I don't have to draw a diagram, but just have to draw a young person uh, on her quest for, for discovery. Uh, so, so I think with many thought experiments, like it just depends on, on, on what we do with it in part, like how we engage with it. But there is also the inherent power of the thought experiment. And that power is revealed like with, with Plato's cave, not so much in how realistic it is, but in how far we, it helps us to think basically. Yeah. Yeah. To your point, in my course, Allegory of the Cave is probably the first experiment I expose students to. And I, at the outset, I have to immediately tell them, okay, none of this is realistic. Please don't ask questions of like, where do these people use the bathroom? Or like, do their muscles atrophy? Or, you know, <laughs> questions like that, which kind of goes back to, to Andrew's possible criticism. One of Andrew's favorite thought experiments is the trolley problem. And, you know, the, the thing is like, well, you're never going to encounter a, a moment where five people and one people are, are tied to different tracks and you have to throw a switch. But like you said, it does put us in this place of having to think about the problem mm -hmm. in a way that that might be applicable in some other aspect of our life, obviously not presented in that particular way. That's right. Yeah, that was another one. Like I just saw too many images of the trolley problem and I just didn't <laughs> see like how to how to draw it in such a way that I could add something to it. So I didn't. Like, so it, yes. this book does not aim at completeness. It just aims at giving visual illustrations and commentaries mm -hmm. to thought experiments. So you mentioned the, the difficulties in coming up with perhaps some imagery for the allegory of the cave illustration. And earlier you mentioned Mary's room. Uh, I noticed when I was looking through it that you used red poppies, like you mentioned, whereas a lot of people will say uh, like a red apple. So one of the aspects of thought experiments is that oftentimes they're rather sparse on detail. So as an illustrator, you have to take some liberties with that in order to create an image that that people will associate with it, but also perhaps do it in a in a way that I mean, if there's not a lot of detail provided, you have to use some liberties there. Um, you already mentioned uh, with people seeds as well, some, some of the issues that came, not issues, but other aspects you drew upon to, uh, to create that. Uh, were there any other interesting thought experiments that, I don't know if difficult time is the right, right word, but, but I guess I'll use it, a difficult time coming up with an illustration for a particular thought experiment? Yeah, some of them went like spontaneously. I got the right idea about, but sometimes you had to think. Like take, for example, Clark and Chalmers's, um thought experiment of the extended mind. I think mm -hmm. actually this thought experiment has really aged well. Like some exper thought experiments have aged rather poorly, like Jim and the Indians, for example. It's just so mm -hmm. <laughs> offensive uh, right. by Bernard Williams. But this one I think is so sweet. So you have this Otto and Enga, and David Chalmers told me that the names of these people are actually referencing the sort of thing they stand for. So Enga visits the Museum of Modern Arts in New York City uh, by just consulting her memory. She wants to go there, so she just walks there and she sees it. And then you have Otto. Otto is a man who has lived in New York City all his life. Or at least maybe that's already me interpreting that. I don't know if that's said in the original thought experiment. But he's lived in New York City um, and he starts to forget things. So he's Alzheimer's. But he consults a notebook in order to get around. And in this notebook, he puts all sorts of important facts, etc. So this is 1998. And uh, Andy Clark and, and David Chalmers, particularly Andy Clark says, like, now I just take it phone. Like, I think the thought experiment is maybe dated 1998. Because now, of course, you know, Otto would put all those facts, like where the Museum of Modern Arts is, on his phone. But I actually right. like the low tech of a, of a notebook. I feel in a sense that sometimes it could be more reliable. Like 
never will run out of battery. It will not suddenly update the Android operating system. Like it's always there. <laughs> so I, I, I understand like even now, Otto could use the notebook. Uh, and he uses the notebook in order to consult where the Museum of Modern Art is, and he goes there. So when I think about such thought experiments, and Otto is sort of an, uh, a reference to external and outer, and then Inga to, to inner. Mm. That's, that's what they did. So when I was thinking about this, I thought this is actually a really fun thought experiment. Like there is the reality of Alzheimer's, and I've seen people like many people. I've seen people decline with Alzheimer's and sort of become shadows of their former selves. And it's mm. completely heartbreaking. But at the same time, the fact that he still goes to museums is such a heartening idea, right? So I, I drew him with that sort of idea in mind. And I had this whole view of, of Otto living in New York City and, you know, being a widow. I don't know, like, I don't want to go too much into it. But I, when I think about these characters and I draw them, there's a whole world that I think about them. And then I draw them. Uh, I also drew Inga. I also made up a whole biography for her. Uh, and then, you know, as I'm making sketches of what the, what, what the plan looks like, and I'm thinking about these characters, um, I get a clearer picture of what the final image should look like. So that's, that's the sort of thing that I'm, and I wanted to make it joyous. So I was trying to look for pictures that depicted fun and joyous things. So one example is say, um, Hilary Putnam's uh, Water and XYZ. So he has this idea of Oscar and twin Oscar and Oscar lives on, on, on our earth and water is H2O, but twin Oscar lives on twin earth, which is very similar. Like it's a close possible world, except water has a very complicated formula that is not H2O, but it's shortened as XYZ. Like, are they both drinking water? Like, is this the same thing? If it's just their mental state, then it's the same thing. So I was thinking about Oscar as this young man who, you know, enjoys going for a swim and drinking and working out. And so that's, that's what you see. So usually I got thinking about the characters and the sparsity, as you say, like there's not much detail, but trying to think more about what sort of person somebody like Otto or Oscar is, or sometimes there's not even a name of a, of a character. Then you have to think about like, should I draw like a man, a woman, a non-binary person? You know, what, what should I, what should the person look like? Uh, and that gives then a better idea, you know, starting from the character about how to draw uh, the thought experiment. I'm curious, after engaging with these thought experiments for so long, for as illustrating them, I'm sure it, it took a while. I, I could be wrong. I guess I have two questions with this. First, I guess after engaging with them for so long, did you, did you kind of have any insights on these thought experiments or did they make you think of anything new? as a philosopher. And then my second question, I guess I'll ask it now too, is since you were engaging with these thought experiments for so long, were there any that you got like really tired of at the end or anything like that? <laughs> I have worked at this uh, a total of three years. Uh, and, you know, I draw in my spare time. Like I don't even take it as research time, even though it did lead to a research output, but it does take quite some hours. I, I can't really say how many hours because it's difficult, like with our writing, like with the time that you're sort of walking around or jogging and thinking mm. about what it should look like. And you think, oh, I have it, but also I have no pen and paper. So then you try <laughs> to get keep the image in your mind. Uh, but I think a total of, of uh, three years and at least, I think, 10 hours per thought experiments. And that's actually quite a short time uh, that is part of the fact that I didn't have to like to let paint dry and stuff like that. Uh, so, so it was quite a lot. And I think in the end, it became rather like, I just wanted it out uh, of the door. I just wanted it done. Like I started to also like, I, I really wanted some thought experiments like Plato's cave in. And I was sort of thinking like, how am I going to draw these? Like, I didn't mind that I didn't have the trolley problem. Uh, because I feel like there's already many good illustrations and animations, et cetera, out there. But some of them, I really wanted to say something. Uh, and it was, it was difficult. So it wasn't always easy to, to think about how to, how to make something come alive, right? Because it's uh, what you, you want to give a commentary, a visual commentary. And it's, it's also something like, I didn't mention this yet, but I think I should do so now. 
that actually visually, using the visual modality in our thinking about concepts that are abstract, is actually ancient. So you can see it like medieval paintings. Medieval European paintings are full of all sorts of visual references, but they are philosophical, but they are visual. Like if you take a Van Eyck painting, like you have the little dog, for example, in the Arno Feeling marriage, you have the slippers, you have like the, the mirror, and all these things are filled with significance. The fact that there is a bed as they are standing there hand in hand and it's called their marriage is significant. So there is a tradition, and the medievals actually, they were thoroughly steeped in this visual tradition. They could see things, they could read a painting the way that, you know, we read a book now, they would see these elements and instantly know what it is. So I sort of recapture something like that, but there is the added problem that we don't really have, like we have some shared vocabulary and I used some of that in, in the thought experiments. Um, so for example, you have the story about Henry and his, and his son who go to the countryside to look at barns uh, by, by Goldman. So Alvin Goldman has this thought experiment where, I don't think it is actually Alvin Goldman, it's somebody else, uh, as the person who wrote the, the commentary, Clayton Littlejohn says. So, so you have, uh, I think, Gigné, who uh, has this idea about, you have these, these people and they go and see the countryside and they see all these barns, but actually they're all fake barn facades and there's only one real barn. It just happens to point at the real barn. Does he know it's the real barn? And I felt like reading that, like, I sort of thought of like Disney and, and Tex Avery, etc., uh, mm. sort of things from the 50s, you know, like with bright colors and the country, the American countryside. So I sought to sort of reproduce that. But you never know for sure if the audience will, will pick up on these things, will pick up on these details. Yeah, that's a good point. I remember the barn illustration. And now that you mentioned Tex Avery, that, that certainly I would not have thought about it at the moment. But that makes a lot of sense now that I think about it. I guess along this same line of thinking, when we talk about illustrations and philosophy, and we talk about like philosophical methodology, philosophy is presented in, in all kinds of different ways. You've just mentioned art, of course. Some philosophy is poetry, such as like the Tao Te Ching. Uh, of course, aphorisms with Nietzsche or maybe Marcus Aurelius, or of course, the Platonic uh, dialogues. So philosophy is uh, presented in a lot of different ways, but some people will look at, say, maybe a novel by Camus and, and say, uh, that might be philosophical in nature, but it's not philosophy. Mm. Is there a line somewhere between between all those things, like, say, with a, an illustration? And maybe this gets us into like the philosophy of art or something. But, you know, with an illustration that's intended to be philosophical or philosophy, I guess my question is, can, can an illustration be philosophy? I think yes, but I am very broad in uh, what can count as philosophy. So I know some people want to put some boundaries. Maybe we want to protect our profession because, yeah, if anything can be philosophy, then, you know, what are we doing? <laughs> but, uh, you know, in line with people like Eric Schwitzgebel and, and others who have this very liberal and broad conception of philosophy, uh, I think that images can and frequently are f philosophy, right? That there is an important aspect. Like there are also other things. There are also images, etc. Just like a novel by Camus is philosophy, but it's also a novel. Mm -hmm. uh, and I th one of my reasons for being so liberal about philosophy and not want to bound boundary police it too much is that there has been too much boundary policing in philosophy. And I understand that this is just a consequence of the professionalization of the discipline. But I, I feel that it has gone increasingly at the expense of the sorts of things that we can say, right? If we're going to chop things into the unit of 8,000 word papers that also look at topics that people happen to find interesting and that there's conversations about in the main journals, uh, that creates an incentive structure that actually makes it difficult for us to engage with a lot of things that we find really important and that philosophers have traditionally thought about, but that we can't quite engage or engage in a way that would be interesting and productive. Like if you'd sent an, a dialogue now 
Maybe there would be a philosophy journal who would take that, but probably not. Like they would probably desk reject it. And, you know, uh, you desk reject things that don't seem to fit the form. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's why I think it's good to, to be expansive about the form. Like maybe I'm wrong. Maybe, maybe I'm wrong and, and some things really fall outside of philosophy. But on the other hand, I don't think there's a metaphysical fact of the matter of what philosophy is, right? Philosophy is not a set set of methods it's not you know a set of questions as mary midgley says it's not that these are the philosophical questions and these are non-philosophical questions no what becomes a philosophical question can change over time right and mm -hmm. and so so that's why i think it's it's okay to be to be really liberal in one's notion of what philosophy is yeah i, I agree there, there must be at, at some point something must not be philosophical i suppose but i definitely fall in the camp of a of a broad interpretation yeah. of of philosophy that probably just comes from my own background of how i fell into philosophy as well which which was through poetry as a teenager that's a good way to fall oh isn't yeah it? <laughs> <laughs> i'm interested in this section in your book about uh philosophy of religion on this podcast we're about to uh, begin a series on philosophy of religion and we know that you're heavily involved in that branch of philosophy so what do you find so compelling about philosophy of religion I think, so religion, in my view, is a way of people to deal in a variety of ways with things they find existentially and socially important. And I know that there's like, I have been a lot involved with cognitive science of religion, where people downplay the sort of existential dimension of religion. But I still think that's just actually wrong. And I have good reasons uh, to think that it's wrong, that religion is also existentially, like, sure, it's also socially regulative and so on, but it's also existentially important. So if you then look at the philosophy of, if you look at religion philosophically, then you look at those, you, you, you put into scrutiny and into view those solutions that people have to, to deal with all sorts of existential questions. You look not at, at, thought experiments that somebody just dreamt up, but you look at, you always come out from out of a tradition. Now, some people say that uh, philosophy of religion as done in Western philosophy departments is too Christianity centric. And it presupposes without argument that the God that they're interested in talking about is the God of uh, Abrahamic mm -hmm. theism and very often Christianity. But on the other hand, that is just the background where many philosophers of religion come from. Like, it's difficult to abstract away from that. Uh, and philosophy of religion does give us these tools to think about, uh, about religion. Because there is this sort of idea about that some, some beliefs are basically a sort of, those beliefs a bit like, I like cauliflower or I don't. Uh, it's just sort of like your own your own opinion or your own, like it could be just something that you believe and it's, it shouldn't be put into scrutiny. So many people think that religious beliefs are like that. Religious beliefs are just the sort of deep existential metaphysical things that we have and we should question. But I think that it is sometimes good. I think it's good to question all our beliefs, like not in a sort of Cartesian skepticism where you think like, oh, do I even, you know, do I even have a physical body? Although, you know, you could do that sometimes, you know, on a Sunday afternoon. <laughs> but uh, I think sometimes you have to think critically about your religious beliefs. You should hold them up to scrutiny. You should hold up all your beliefs to scrutiny. Like, otherwise, you're just sort of walking around. Like, you know, it's the sort of thing that makes us human, that we are not just uh, sort of beholden to the things that we happen to grow up with, that we can, can challenge those things and think about them. So that's what I think could be the f function of philosophy of religion to hold up those things to scrutiny. Wonderful. Before we get to our, our final question, this next question is just entirely self-indulgence on my part. I teach the Tao Te Ching in my course, and I did notice that some of the uh, Chinese thought experiments are Taoist in reference. Oh, and, all right, right. Yeah, yeah so, so, so I didn't know if you uh, perhaps leaned towards Taoism or appreciate Taoism or... 
I really appreciate Taoism. Yeah. yeah. So I, I do have a Confucian thought experiment, namely Mengzi's Child at the Well. Okay. It's a thought. It's a Confucian thought experiment, and then I have a Mohist one as well. Yes, yes, namely, I remember the Mohist um, one. That's yeah. right. That's right. Yeah, but I do have two from Zhuangzi, and I had to stop myself to not do more because you could basically you could illustrate the Zhuangzi and the Tao Te Ching, and uh, people have already done this as mm-hmm. well because they are so visual. Uh, I think Taoism is is really interesting for you know the sort of situation that we find ourselves in today. Like it is very flexible. It it does. It's particularist. It's sort of like there is not just one way to engage with things. You have to find your way to hook into the Tao. I think this is how how it's it's commonly translated. So uh, the Zhuangzi, I think, chapter two. There is this idea of this and that, like, mm-hmm. you know, you can, there is a way that you have to find your own way. Uh, you shouldn't sort of like, because we are often very confusion in our mm-hmm. thinking about mm-hmm. philosophy. Like there is a certain thing to go through. Like you have to make sure to get into the best grad school and you have to publish in the top journals and you have to like rub shoulders with the most important people in the discipline. And you should like, this is a very sort of confusion way of dealing mm-hmm with philosophy as these sorts of, there's all sorts of etiquettes and rules and you sort of inhabit those and then you become, you know, somebody who effortlessly glides along in the discipline. But I think that the, the way that Zhuangzi talks about, you also have it a little bit in the Nao De Ching, about that you should try not to strive mm. for this sort of external stuff, that you should find a kind of authenticity within and that you should try to find your way to engage with things, like your way of being in the world, is a very important lesson for everybody. Right? Every, I think everybody could benefit from that. So I find that very attractive. I'm not a Taoist, but I find that very attractive. <laughs> yeah, I just love that. My students are fascinated with the Tao Te Ching when I teach it. Students have gone on and, and told me how they've incorporated you know, Wu Wei into their lives and, and, uh, mm-hmm. and aspects of that. I don't know. I just, I just happened to notice that. It's my own uh, bias there, noticing the Taoist <laughs> elements in the book. This is a question that we usually ask of all of our guests at the end of every episode. So we wanted to ask you. And so the question is very simple. What does it mean to be human? Oh dear, what does it mean to be human? Simple question. Yeah, yeah. right. <laughs> simple, very, very simple, simple question. Okay. Okay, I'm going to answer it by basically drawing on the paper that I'm writing now. So, in the book. So, in the 17th century, people began to realize that we don't live in this little onion of crystalline spheres with the earth nicely in the middle and you know then you have all the spheres uh, and the stars were basically on just one sphere, like the outer sphere, like just sort of like little jewels in the night sky. But then people began to realize that this was not true and there were no spheres and there was just a vast, vast universe. And that, you know, you have people like Blaise Pascal who say, look, I'm there, like my life is so brief and that the, the, the earth is a tiny dot in a huge vastness of infinite worlds um and and what does it mean for me like so so this was a question that many philosophers genuinely grappled with the idea of cosmic horror Uh, and i think one of the nice things about us humans is that we are able to at least in some times to realize this to realize the full significance of that Um, you you can look at the night sky you can read philosophy and then you become aware of that in a way that I think other animals just don't ever, I don't think they get, like maybe they get sort of like, Jane Goodall talks about chimpanzees being awed by storms, so who knows. But I think particularly humans, we do this. And then we sort of think like, what does it all mean? What does it mean? Like, I'm in this brief flicker. Uh, what does it mean for, for me? Like, how do, how do I make a difference? Like, uh, and that is the thing that we grapple with. Uh, you know, socially together as communities, like we build things, we try to achieve things, we strive for things, we dream things. You know, you look at old 
like buildings like cathedrals and Angkor Wat, etc. And you think, yeah, people, in spite of it all, in spite of the fact that they, they didn't live long, uh, you know, they <laughs> shorter than now today, they, they did aspire to things like that. And that, I think, is really the, the epitaph of humanity. Mm. Like I am now taking lute classes again and I was struggling with a passage. It was extremely difficult. And my lute teacher said, you make things too difficult on yourself. I said, not at all. This is really genuinely difficult. Like this is such a difficult passage. And he said, look, there's people that were dying left and right in the 16th, 17th century. Life was very, very hard for them. Harder than it is now for many people, like particularly people in developed countries. Mm-hmm. But so they wouldn't make things difficult for themselves. Like they, they, make, they play lute music because they wanted to enjoy themselves and to make something beautiful. Uh, and I think that defiance, in, in spite of it all, like, you know, we, we see a constant horror show on the news. I think that's what it means to be human, or at least that's uh, how I think about us being human now. Oh, that's beautiful, Helen. Helen, thank you so much for being on the show with us today, discussing thought experiments in your book, Philosophy Illustrated, 42 Thought Experiments to Broaden Your Mind. Absolutely loved your perspective. Thank you again for for coming on. I really enjoyed it. And I thought the book was really cool. So I'm super excited for people to check that out. Thank you so much for inviting me to talk about the book. It was a really wonderful conversation. Thank you. right everybody well that's gonna wrap it up for this week's episode once again special thank you to helen day cruz and definitely go check out her book it's really interesting i really enjoyed looking through it the illustrations definitely provide an interesting way to think about and discover these thought experiments yep 100 percent. and if you guys want to connect with us on any of our social medias or any other ways you can get a hold of us almost everywhere we got, a, we got the Twitter going on. We got Instagram. There's our website, Open Door Philosophy, which, by the way, we'll have a link to the book. Boy, I feel like we're somewhere else. Email. Oh, yes. That old thing. <laughs> she can also message us. Not message us. That's, that's not a function of email. You can email us at opendoorphilosophy at gmail.com. Once again, special shout out to uh, Kevin McLeod for the use of his free music really groovy really like it so uh thanks very thank you very much and i guess that's it andrew do you know how to say goodbye in italian uh arrivederci uh ciao ciao yeah i guess arrivederci works too all right ciao my friend have a great time in italy all right thank you until we meet again until we meet again all right bye everyone wait should we do our sign off oh yeah that's right the sign off and If your life is ever in need of some philosophy, the door is always open. Ciao.